everybody. I, I trust that if you're like me, meeting uh, spiritually as we're doing right now, uh, just reminds us of how grateful we should be for the regular gift that we have of meeting in person. That there's really nothing like being in the same room, room together, hearing each other's voices sing. So I just want to express to you how much we would rather be gathering with you, how much we are very much looking forward to that moment when we can all be together in that same room again. Let's look forward to that together. Uh, but though we are separated physically, as you know, we are together in Christ. We are together in the Spirit. And just as we would if we were in our normal church gathering, we want to open our Bibles together. There is nothing more important right now than to turn to our Lord, to turn to his word. So if you would open your Bibles to the Psalms, Psalm 46 in particular. And as we do this, let's let's realize the discipline that we are undertaking right now. We are we are consciously turning away from all of the news reports, which are valuable, and all of the expectations and predictions and projections and recommendations. We're, we're consciously turning to the one person who knows all things, who has all things in his hands under his control, who watches every sufferer, who watches every person who is facing anxiety and who speaks with the comfort of his authority. This is a, a glorious discipline that we have, brothers and sisters, to turn to his word, especially in a global moment like this. So let's read Psalm 46 together. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. In my office, uh, there is a picture of a man standing on the bottom level of a, a lighthouse. And the lighthouse looks solid and secure. Maybe you've seen this picture. It's, it's out there. Um, Christian bookstores and elsewhere. The lighthouse looks solid, but around the lighthouse is this overwhelming wave. And the man seems surprisingly calm. He stands there almost casually, leaning uh, against the lighthouse, and the wave just appears ready to engulf him. And yet he is absolutely secure. And I, I pray that that man, that little depiction, can be a picture of us at this moment. Because all of us as Christians, if we are believers in the Lord Jesus, we stand on the rock of our salvation. Mm -hmm. We stand in the refuge. And though the appearance right now is that there is a, a wave of engulfing danger and uncertainty and worry and anxiety, the reality is God's people stand secure in him. And they are called to live in light of that security. It's not just that we are secure, it's that we are to act secure. We're to act confident and reassured and, and full of faith and lacking in any fear. The, the point of this psalm is to remind us and to help God's people understand that since God is steadfast in his faithfulness, we must be steadfast in our faith. 
Since God is steadfast in his faithfulness, we must be steadfast in our faith. Brothers and sisters, we have a particular responsibility right now. We have a responsibility to point people through our demeanor, through our, our words and actions, to point our children and those around us, and most importantly, to demonstrate to the Lord our confidence in his goodness and wisdom and faithfulness. And this psalm is intending to do that this morning. It's intending to, to help bolster that faith so that our faith can reflect his faithfulness. That's what we want this morning. God is our refuge. And since he is steadfast, our faith should be steadfast as well. The psalmist gives three reasons why we can trust our God, all about God's faithfulness to be a refuge for his people. Three reasons. He is our security in chaos. He is our preservation in danger, and he is our future hope. Let's just walk through this psalm and, and benefit from his motivation this morning. He says that God is our refuge and our strength. I would summarize these first three verses as God being our security in chaos. He says that God is a very present help in trouble. His help is abundant for us. And the result of this security is that we will not fear. We will not be afraid. This is the point this morning, that the, the people of God are meant to live in light of the fact that they stand inside the refuge that God is. That when they are personally weak or when they are facing trouble, they are strong and secure in the person of God. That God helps us when we are in trouble. You notice that it's not that God's people are never in physical trouble. It's not that they never face physical calamities. It's that in those moments, they have a confidence that God is their refuge, that ultimately they are secure in him. And the psalmist wants to make it very clear that these kinds of calamities might be in the extreme. So he uses a kind of a graphic metaphor. He says, we will not fear, so secure are we in our God, that we will not fear, though the earth itself gives way. Look down at your Bibles and notice this. Though the earth itself gives, gives way. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, and its waters roar and foam, and the mountains tremble at its swelling. What the psalmist is doing here, like a, like a good Hebrew poet, he's, he's using word pictures to depict an ultimate spiritual reality. He's saying, try to imagine a moment where the things that seem in life to be the most secure, the most immovable, the most steadfast things, which especially in this era would be a mountain. There's nothing more secure uh, than a mountain. A mountain uh, doesn't tremble. A mountain is absolutely, literally rock solid. But imagine if the mountains were to be plucked up and thrown into the sea. For an Israelite, the sea was, was not just a, a place for vacations. It actually was the opposite. It represented chaos and anarchy and devastation. It was a mysterious and dangerous place. And so the, the, the mountains being thrown into the sea is a depiction of that which is most stable becoming the most chaotic. It's this idea that the things that we most trust and the things we most have confidence in, the things that we're sure would never be shaken, actually being thrown into chaos. And, and don't we catch a glimpse of that in this world right now? Haven't you sensed a bit of that as we faced this kind of unique global trial? Probably not in my lifetime, perhaps not in my parents' or grandparents' lifetime, has there been something quite like this? where we're facing a moment where many of our most secure places of confidence are now being questioned. They're trembling at the swelling of chaos. Well, the Bible is not foreign to those kinds of moments. Actually, the Bible intends to help us in precisely moments like this. When it says, what will you do if your most secure areas of life, the things you most have confidence in, the thing you most trust in, if that thing becomes chaos, becomes untrustworthy. Well, the psalmist says that for God's people, in that moment, we will not fear. 
we will not fear. And when we think about the coronavirus and its implications and repercussions around the world, we can connect that to very real items in our life that we tend to trust in. The health of our community, the possibility that there may not be for some time a medical cure for a disease we may face soon, the plunge of the stock market, retirement accounts that were worth much more two weeks ago than they are right now, business markets in fluctuation, global travel in fluctuation, workplaces in fluctuation. Isn't it as though mountains are trembling? Isn't that what it feels like culturally? Our mountains of security have, over the course of a number of weeks, been tossed into a sea of chaos. As I was thinking about this idea, I was reminded, actually, of the story of the Titanic, which you know, where when that ship sailed, it was hailed as the unsinkable vessel. Vessel could not be sunk. It was unable uh, to be uh, to be sunk. And, and yet, as you know, the story went, uh, the unthinkable happened. Humans are always desiring to set up unsinkable mountains in our lives. We all do it. It's, it's normal and natural in our human state. There's something secure about being able to look out the window, metaphorically, and look at your mountain and know that it's there. Maybe that mountain is our confidence in, in modern medicine, or maybe it's our bank account, or maybe it's our job. Maybe it's our health, or the health of our children, or our parents. Maybe it's just everyday life and people, the ability to interact with people on a regular basis, even something as good and God-honoring as going to church. Sometimes we can look at normal patterns of life, even good things, and we can transfer our trust to them instead of placing our trust in the Lord. And yet, the Lord, the Lord is our refuge. God is our strength. God is the reason we need not fear. God is that rock that we stand on when the wave of trouble and uncertainty comes around to us. God is the one that holds us up in that wave. Let me make my first recommendation. With each point, I want to make a recommendation specific to the coronavirus moment that we're facing as a human race right now. Let's let the coronavirus chaos cause us to remove our trust in anything but God. It is a simpler spiritual discipline to do now because you're aware of things that seem chaotic, normal things that we might be tempted to trust in. Let's seize this moment. Let's not waste this moment of suffering, this moment of trial. Let's allow our trust to transfer from any mountain and place it on the Lord. What is that for you? Maybe there's a, a mountain of, of worry, a mountain of worry related to your finances or your health or your job. Let's transfer our trust from that mountain to the Lord. Though the mountains tremble, we will not fear. God is our refuge and our strength. This is our calling. Jerry Bridges, one of my spiritual heroes who is with the Lord now and is not worried about any virus at all, says this, trust is not a passive state of mind. It is a vigorous act of the soul by which we choose to lay hold on the promises of God and cling to them despite the adversity that at times seeks to overwhelm us. Let's exercise that, that vigorous clinging right now. This is not a time for passive trust. This is not a time for assuming that we can trust God. This is a time for active trust, seizing, seizing moments when things seem to be trembling. We're aware of trembling mountains and declaring with the psalmist, God is my refuge and my strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not Fear. Now, of course, we should not be brash or arrogant or indifferent to suffering. Suffering is real. The trembling is real. And sometimes good things tremble. 
Sometimes good things tremble and, and, and they tremble for righteous people. Sometimes people experience severe suffering, even God's people experience severe troubles and trials and difficulty. This psalm is not written to declare God's people will never suffer. It's written to tell us that when you suffer, when your mountain trembles, trust the God who made the mountains, who is your refuge and your strength. Let's exercise that vigorous act of the soul and lay hold of his promises. Okay, second area that the psalmist points us to, after saying that he is our security in chaos, is that he is our preservation in danger. Look at this beautiful verse, verse 4. It says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord is of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This takes the scene from the mountains to the city. And it depicts a people in the midst of a city that perhaps are under siege. It talks about the nations raging. And we can think of Israel surrounded by enemies, perhaps. And, and the idea here is that this city is far from lacking protection or provision. Actually, God has taken care of both. It begins by talking about this river whose streams make glad the city of God. We want to go back to this era in history and remember that if you were under siege, uh, you needed water. And we can even experience that functionally uh, this week, can't we? Where people are, are eager and, and, and understandably so, desiring to make sure that supplies last Listen, in that era, people very much understood that if an enemy surrounded you, where were you going to get your water supply? Well, this city has a river of provision that is God himself. God himself provides for his people. God himself provides for everything they need to know and love him and live for him. God himself gives them what they need. God is in the midst of this city. They have not been left alone in this trouble. And because of that, the city of God's people shall not be moved. There is no enemy who can invade and invade and take what belongs to the Lord. There is no enemy who can overwhelm the fortress that is God. God is their preservation. You notice it says in verse 5 that God will help her when morning dawns. The, the idea, perhaps, is that a city, especially in that era, in the night felt vulnerable. There was a feeling of vulnerability in the night because it's dark and you can't see. There's no electricity to see enemies that might be creeping up on the city. And yet every day the morning comes and the night is broken. That feeling of vulnerability concludes. And he seems to be comparing that to the fact that God will help her. That even should the enemy seek to attack, God is there with her. God is with his people. The nations rage against the Lord. Psalm 2 begins the psalm book by talking about the raging of the nations against God. And yet, in spite of that surrounding danger and kingdoms that come and go, princes that rise and fall, there is one whose very voice can melt the earth, whose power exceeds any power on earth. And that one, his all-powerful word, is with us, with his armies of power. He is our fortress, verse 7 says. He will provide and he will protect his people. Brothers and sisters, this is a truth that we need to cling vigorous, vigorously to right now. God is with us to provide and to protect. Now, I think the primary emphasis here is certainly on spiritual enemies of God's people who are waging war against them, attacking them for their belief in God, desiring to consume them as enemies of God. But certainly the Bible also includes in the enemies of God's people the wages of sin, death itself, and the, the vulnerability that we face because we live in a fallen world. That, that's part 
of the enemies that surround God's people. Actually, it says uh, in the scriptures that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. That death is like an enemy of God's people. And, and don't you feel the reality of that enemy surrounding humanity in a moment like this? I, I do. You, you can easily find maps about various death counts, fatalities because of this disease, those who have contacted it, the understandable worry and concern and fear, death has been made very present. Now, it is always a reality for us, but in this kind of moment, it's made very present to us. There is, there is no human being on earth who will ultimately face death, but we can sometimes think death is a bit more tame than it actually is. It's a bit more controllable. In a moment like this, it, it feels very near to us. It feels as, as near as a, a, a gathering, as, as close as a conversation. It feels very close to us in a moment like this. It is an enemy, isn't it? We, we are meant to hate death. Death is, is meant to be this thing that is an enemy of God, an enemy of his people because of the results of sin. Death was not original to God's creation. God created man and woman to live forever in joy and peace and harmony with him. And yet because of sin, death entered the world as a punishment for sin. And that enemy stalks mankind. And, and yet this passage tells us that God offers refuge to all those who trust in him from the surrounding stalking nature of their enemies, including death. That God is the river of life to sustain them and the army to guard them when their enemies come around them. And so what this means for us very practically is we are not afraid of death. Though we are aware of its pain and its difficulty and we hate it as a result of the fall. And yet, on the other hand, death has no longer any power over those who belong to the Lord because he has become the river of life for his people. Even as Jesus said, I am the water of life. Come to me and you will never be thirsty again. Jesus is life. He is the resurrection and the life. All those who believe in him no longer fear the judgment of death. For the Christian, death has no longer become an enemy that we are afraid of. It is merely now a doorway into our eternal life. As one illustration has put it, death is like the shadow that passes over the Christian as they enter into the world of eternal joy with their king. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we do not fear enemies that surround us because we have life in Christ, who is the water of life. We have the king of hosts who guards us. And that same king succumbed to death in our place. There was only one person on earth who had no fear of death because he had no sin in himself, and that was Jesus. Jesus Christ, God the Son, was made man and faced the vulnerabilities that, that we are feeling right now. The vulnerabilities of a body that can't ultimately sustain itself. The vulnerabilities of a, a lung capacity. I, I was struck this week thinking about some of the, the ravages of this terrible sickness for those that have died. And it, it reminded me of the Lord Jesus and his death on the cross. I thought, Lord, you, you, Lord Jesus, we can say this directly to him. You faced the curse of death and the horror of it that we are thinking about these days. You faced that curse and took it on yourself to pay the penalty for our sin, the death that is the wages of sin. Christ himself absorbed so that any death we face, whether now or 50 years from now, is just a shadow. It's just a passing. It's no longer the great horror that it was for him. And if you're watching this and you are not a believer in the Lord Jesus, I know you're aware of the many, many news reports and the danger of the virus and many other types of death that stalk us on a regular basis. Brothers and sisters, here, here we are. And I want to speak directly to you as someone who does not believe in Jesus. Turn to him. 
Turn to him. We are, we are a family. We are brothers and sisters because we believe in Jesus. And if you are here watching with us, we welcome you. But we want you to turn to Jesus as well because we want you to know this protection. We want you to know the one who took death in place of his people. We want you to know the one who can be a protection for you against the curse of death so that when your time comes to die, you can open your eyes and see his face. We want you to be like us, able to look death in the eye, unafraid. Able to say we have joy, we have gladness, because God is with us, and Christ has taken the curse of death in our place, and we have life in him. So if, if you are not a Christian, let me urge you, turn to the Lord Jesus. Turn to him and trust in him. There is no mountain that can protect you from the danger of the curse of death and the second death that comes after that when you face the judgment of God. But God himself offers that if you would come to him and believe in the Lord Jesus, you can be set free from the curse of death. You can know him. You can love him. And you will be with him forever. Look, is there ever a better time than right now to turn away from those things that are not trustworthy, that cannot save you, and to turn to the Lord Jesus and the God who offers to be your protection. Let me urge you to do that this morning. And if you are watching this and you are a Christian, brother and sister in Christ, let me urge you to rejoice at the peace that we have in a moment like this. Let me remind you that God is with us, that God is our fortress, that Christ swallowed all the horror of death, so that even the smallest chance of death right now need not cause us any. God is our preservation in danger. Finally, God is our future hope. The psalmist in verse 8 turns a corner. He asks us to imagine the world itself as a, a basically a battleground in which wars and <laughs> fighting has been taking place and suddenly the Lord has cause all of those wars to suddenly cease. It depicts a moment where, where God has simply spoken into the antagonism that is present in this world and eliminated it all. Behold the works of the Lord, verse 8 says. He has brought desolations on the earth. And what has he destroyed? Notice, what has God destroyed? He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear, the implements of war. He burns the chariots with fire. And the result for God's people is that we are to be still. We are to know that he is God, that he will be exalted. The one who will eliminate the effects of sin will be exalted in the end. Listen, this is our opportunity right now to be still and to know. The, the commentators point out that, that that word be still is, is probably not the same kind of comforting word that we often take it to be. Oh, be still and lay back and take it easy. It, it's more of a command. Stop your busyness. Stop your anxious lifestyle. Be still. The word of authority comes from God. Be still and you need to know something. There's one truth you need to know. Be still and know that I am God. Be still, he says. And as God's people, we need to humbly and gratefully receive that, recommend, that, that command. That command comes to us. Be still, God's people, and know that he is God. Those chariots that seem so unstoppable are so many piles of ash. The bow and the arrow that seem deadly has been brought to an end. He has eliminated in this moment all danger for his people. He has destroyed all of the effects of the fall. It, it should bring to mind that great day when the Lord Jesus returns, when he comes back to us and he removes all effects of the curse from his people and he takes them to be with him. And there is, there is no more crying. There is no more death. There is no more war. And in anticipation of that moment, we obey him and say, we will be still in our minds and in our hearts, and we will know that you are God. 
Like the Israelites before the Red Sea, we are called to be still and fix our hearts on the Lord, the God who is over and above all calamities on this earth, including plagues and death itself. We are to be still in peaceful trust and submission to the God who has us in his hands, the rock on which we stand. Be still and know that he is God. And there is none other. He is God, and there is none like him. So here's another recommendation as we face this terrible sickness. Spend time being still and thinking about heaven as we endure this trial. Anxiety craves activity of mind and body. But trust in the Lord finds expression in still moments of peaceful trust and faith. Anxiety craves activity of mind and body, something I can read, something I can do, something I can get. But trust in the Lord finds expression in still moments of peaceful prayer and faith. The end of this life is the beginning of the next for God's people, even the worst of trials is only a temporary inconvenience compared to the eternal glories of our Lord. He will bring about a conclusion of every effect of the fall. The battlefield that is this world will ultimately be removed and we will be with our King in peace. If I could use an illustration as we turn towards the conclusion, you know the, the window cleaners that we've all used to clean windows at some point. We wanna see through the window. We wanna see what's outside. And sometimes I think we're doing that right now a lot. I'm doing that, I know this week, I was very tempted to do that and surely gave in many times. I didn't need to be looking and checking on things, I was. But that's a little bit like a window cleaner where we're, we're cleaning the window and checking what, what's right, right outside, what's right next to me. What's right outside the window? I just wanna, I wanna clean it off real quick and check again. Let me just spray it and clean it. I, I wanna urge all of us to exchange our window cleaner for a telescope. It's not that windows are bad. We need to be checking on occasion the news and seeing what the recommendations are. That's a wise and, and appropriate stewardship. Some activity is godly and appropriate. And yet we need moments that are telescope moments. We're looking far beyond next week and next month and next year and the next news report, the next election, the next societal change, the next different thing that comes along, the next trial that looks far beyond that and sees the moment when God comes to his people in the person of Jesus Christ. Let me encourage you, if most of your moments this week are window cleaning moments, We'll be missing out on our calling. Be still and look. Be still and look far and see the Lord who has promised an end to all of these things. Yes, we have things to do. We have neighbors to serve. We have the gospel to preach. We have work to do. And yet in this moment, in a very real sense, it may be that God has almost enforced a stillness on our society and on people as we simply wait. And yet Christians wait not with a window cleaner, <laughs> with a telescope. So families, gather around that telescope and look far this week. Look far, look to the King, look to the end, look to the glory, look to the conclusion of all of these things. Look first and foremost to the rock. Our God is a rock and refuge. Though the mountains tremble, though the enemy surrounds, though wars, human wars, or pathogen wars come against us, yet, yet, there is a river whose streams make glad the people of God. And one day we will see him. And right now we have the calling to know him. The God of Jacob is our fortress. He is with us. God, God is our refuge. Not a vaccine, not a quarantine, not the government, 
not even excellent doctors and nurses and ventilators and IVs. God is our refuge and our strength. And whatever good means he uses must not distract us from him. So let us share this hope with others. Let us encourage our children with these truths. Let us model a God-centeredness in the midst of a virus-centered world. Let's be God-centered in the midst of a virus-centered world because he is our refuge and our strength. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, all of us, myself included, Lord, have been tempted and probably have given in to being virus-centered this week. Lord, we need certain elements of news. It is a gift to us. We want to be good stewards. We want to be responsible. We want to be prudent. We want to be godly and guarding and loving our neighbors and using wisdom. Lord, we want to do all these things ultimately because we love you. We want to honor honor you with our, our time and our, our stewardship of our bodies. But, but Lord, ultimately, let us not be virus-centered, but God-centered. Help us to fix our eyes on you. You and the glorious truth of your gospel should be the center of our hearts and our minds. Lord, this week, turn all of our minds towards you. Give us that telescope of your word. Help us look far into the future and to see the glory of your return and the certainty of your heavenly kingdom and the security that we have because we are found in you. We trust you and we love you. In Jesus' name.